What is up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Breathe and Air podcast, where everyday action meets extraordinary mindset. Today's guest, he's very in alignment with that. He is a Guinness World Record holder. He's a men's performance coach, has been featured in Men's Health, GQ, Men's Journal. I'm super pumped to have you on. Welcome, Mike Adala. Hey, thanks so much, Mason. I'm really excited to be here and uh, to chat with you. Yeah, so... I'm really interested in the origin of this and how you got into this work. Like what led you to where you are now? Oh man, I've uh, taken many different paths to get to where I'm at now professionally uh, as I work as a men's performance coach, which essentially I work with men on their mental and emotional health. Um, But I started doing strength and conditioning. And so I was pretty fortunate. Uh, The New York Jets came to my college in upstate New York for training camp. And I was able to intern with the strength staff there. Uh, And then that, you know, parlayed into me working out in California at a place now called Exos, but then it was athletes performance. Okay. So I was doing a lot of NFL combine prep, helping guys, you know, get bigger, stronger, faster, make more millions of dollars on their contracts. (laughs) And uh, yeah, then went back to New York and um, was working and managing a strength and conditioning facility just north of Manhattan. Uh, working with more high school or college athletes and general pop. Uh, and then around that, like, maybe two years, two, three years into that, I was really started to become interested in holistic health. This is maybe 12 years ago, 10 years ago. And uh, was interested in why people come to the gym and like what is happening in between the sessions and really in between the sets and the reps. And so uh, that dove me deep into that uh, holistic health world. I traveled the world on what I called an alternative graduate studies program where I just made up what, and my own education, traveled to a bunch of different continents and countries, uh, and then uh, taught yoga for a long time, got into Amazing. many, many different modalities. I'm not sure how, how deep you want me to go, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I guess that's the overview. Right. We can click into it. I'm, did you play uh, collegiate athletics as well? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I played college football. Awesome. What, what position? Uh, I was a safety. Sweet. Where did yeah. you play at? I played too out in Linwood, at, uh, right outside of St. Louis, Missouri. So, Oh, nice. What position did you play? I came in as a quarterback, and that's where I played it in high school. And then my last two years, we got a coaching transition, and I switched over to tight end. Okay. Did you like that transition? Man, it was um, obviously a physical transition, but – it was a mental switch more than anything for me um, mm-hmm. from, you know, all your pre-snap reads to, you know, protections and making sure everyone's in the right place to simply just getting guy out of the hole, running your route, catching the ball. So right. it, it was, it was a big mental switch. There's obviously, I think there was less pressure going into games and stuff, but yeah, that was the biggest thing. There was definitely a transition for my body though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I man, I, re- I relate to that so much. And in high school, I, I played quarterback as well and, and corner. And I led New York State interceptions. Like, that was my thing. I was really good at because I knew the quarterback position. So I knew I could yeah. lead and play with it. Right. And then when I went, when I got recruited, they were like, we're going to put you at Mac, middle linebacker. And I'm like, man, I like, I want to be in space. I want to move. I want to like, right. you know, play basketball on the turf. Yeah. And and uh, that got me into Olympic weightlifting, actually, which I never, I haven't never talked about that on like a podcast or whatnot, but I work with a strength coach um, down in his basement. Uh, and now he runs a place, uh, I think it's called New York Weightlifting Academy mm-hmm. in Thornwood, New York, uh, Mark Chasnoff. And okay. yeah, I put on like 40 pounds in um, the last half of my senior year. I went from like 190 to 230. Yeah. And uh, yeah started out at you know Mike linebacker and then wound up convincing my coach to let me get in some more space yeah that's uh an interesting thing because I remember just being in school and this was before I got more into you know holistic health I was always kind of tapped in but I was just focused on gaining that extra weight you know during that transition I was just shoveling food obviously metabolism's different but to, to say that you can gain 40 pounds in like such a short period of time, it seems crazy, but I mean, that was, it's really a lot, a lot of guys do that, you know? 
Yeah. I mean, I, if I could go back in time, I wouldn't do that again. Um, <laughs> you know, I was eating everything. And one thing I did, I, I was just getting stronger. And so I was running, but not as much. And so I think my muscles grew faster than my ligaments and my tendons. And then I wound up getting a lot of sprains and pulls yeah. in, in my legs in that first year. But I ate a I ate a rotisserie chicken after every dinner <laughs> for like four months, the whole chicken. <laughs> the classic. That's classic. A little yeah. $5 rotisserie chicken. Exactly. Always do the trick. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I think so many lessons that I learned from athletics growing up, what was, what was the biggest thing that you took home from, you know, collegiate athlete being a collegiate athlete or really, you know, any part of your sports? I mean, I think it's kind of like what a lot of people say, right? Like hard work and discipline. And so I remember my coaches being like during a championship game, like you deserve to be here. You put in all the work, all those preseason practices, all that time in the weight room. And it starts to reinforce in your head like, okay, if I put in this work when I'm not necessarily seeing the results right away, it will pay off at the end. And those years when maybe didn't put in as much work, um, it didn't pay off as much. And so now it's, it can really taught ownership, like, you know, especially playing safety, right? I'll probably line up against you. So if you beat me on a pass, right, I got, I just, I got beat. So what I need to do, work on opening my hips, work on my gym, work on something at the line, um, but you can't really hide behind it. And so you have to be able to deal with that failure, learn from it, and then do what you can to uh, improve it and grow. Yeah, absolutely. I'm interested in your transition from, you know, the Olympic weightlifting and the training that goes on to be a collegiate athlete versus a lot of what you're doing now, functional movement. You talked about yoga and, you know, recently you just set a world record for the most weight lifted in a Turkish get up in an hour. Mm -hmm. which is a complex movement. A lot of people may not have heard of this depends on what kind of training background you come from, mm -hmm. but tell me a little bit about that transition of how you got to breaking a world record from, you know, doing Olympic weightlifting. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm just a really curious person. And so uh, I got into yoga through a heartbreak. I broke up with a girlfriend at the time and um, thought that yoga would be good for me to, just have some time with myself and work through some emotions physically. Um, and I fell in love with it. I mean, I fell in love with hot vinyasa yoga and I took like two or three classes a day for like three months. Oh, wow. Got into paddle boarding. I saw like these women in the front of the classes, just like pressing up to handstands, like flowing down. And, you know, I was just, I was like, I'm six, one, like two twenty now. And I was around the same size then. And I'm like, I'm too big for this. I squat, blah, 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 lift all this stuff. I can't do this asana movement practice. Um, but I just, you know, kind of stayed with it and, and just became curious on what it is that my body could do. Same thing with weightlifting. Like when I started, I just used the bar for probably six weeks. And then the next six weeks I was clean and jerking over 300 pounds. And so it's like, okay, if you just kind of stick with something and you get <laughs> this guy's a little corny here, but this company I, I work with and love 10,000, it's just, you get, get a little bit better than yesterday um, and you just improve. Uh, it's exciting. You see that growth. And I think the best athletes and the most successful people in general can see those like really small incremental uh, gains. And then it keeps them motivated to keep moving in that direction. Yeah. I want to kind of tap in a little bit deeper into your headspace before you're about to set out to, you know, break a world record and the cause that you did it for, right. was veteran and suicide prevention. You had someone close to you and your family that this really hit home. So mm -hmm. it seemed like this is an emotional thing for you when you were going into this, what was your headspace like before you're about to set out to break this record? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, it was, emotional i was crying i was like tearing up before yeah. i'm an emotional guy i you know i like to use my emotions and you know be aware of them and lean into them when it's appropriate and uh i wasn't oh, i wasn't anticipating how much it would really overtake me um but there was you know 50 something people that came a lot of veterans i was getting a lot of messages from people that have had suicide affect them um in their life or had struggled with their mental health and right. were thanking me and you know, I'm empathetic. And so I was like, take, trying to take that on, but at the same time, having to lift like a hundred pound kettlebell <laughs> up and down 
150 times. And so yeah. it was a mixture of like, you know, like being in the zone and like really letting myself get emotional, you know, as, yeah. I mean, I don't compete necessarily like with a team like I did in college, but like before a game, you know, got your headphones on, you're in the locker room, you're like five in, you're like, you know, you're going to battle. Like they really yeah. play it up and you don't get, I don't get that a lot in regular mm-hmm. life. And so I was kind of allowing myself to get into that moment. And um, yeah, my grandfather, um, you know, uh, passed from suicide when I was five and it really affected my family and, mm-hmm. um, you know, and stuff that people don't talk about a lot. And so, you know, as I'm talking with my family, I'm learning about myself, my past, why I might act the way that I act or um, maybe lean into some things that when I was younger. And so I, had a picture of my grandfather, you know, printed out and put it on top of the ceiling. So every time I went up to the kettlebell, I see him and I just have to come down wow. and up and down, up and down. Um, but it was cool. You know, you get those like butterflies and that little tingly feeling as, as you're working out. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. You touched on something there that I think is important about leaning into your emotions, right? And especially as men, you know, sometimes that's not as much accepted, right? The, the whole rub, rub some dirt on it kind of thing, especially coming from an athletic background. We, we've heard that all growing up. But what, what advice can you give to someone who's feeling certain emotions and they, you know, maybe pushing them down or, or attaching to them too much to where it's overtaking their lives? Like, what way can we feel these emotions and be able to feel them, recognize them, but not allow them to overtake our lives at the time. Yeah, I'll give an easy analogy. Um, it's like with your house, right? I call our emotions sometimes it's like trash. Like we just gotta take out the trash. It's yeah. useful at a certain moment, yeah. but then we, it doesn't. We don't need it anymore, and so you gotta get rid of it. So that means journal it, talk about it, move it, move it through your body, work out. Yeah. But it's gotta come out of you. Otherwise, it's just gonna fester in you, and mm-hmm. you know, ultimately, can lead to injuries disease you know uh lots of different stress because you know stress is has many different factors but uh, emotional stress is is tremendous i mean there's been studies that have been done um you know with how our mindset can control our bodies to the point of life or death Mm, wow that's that's powerful (laughs) i mean that's and that's where the correlation between our mindset and our thoughts and science meet. And I think that's a cool place because it's undeniable that these things are really important and that we have control over them. Mm -hmm. What is, what's the importance of, you know, seeing your life vision from where you were and being able to, you know, create this business and create this, you know, quote unquote success that you've had in your life. What's the importance of knowing you know, where you want to get before you actually got there. Was that something that came easy for you or did you learn it along the way? Yeah. Um, kind of both, right? Like I'll keep making the sports analogies or like, you know, you want to win the championship. And so you work backwards from there. We got to make the playoffs. We got to win the league. We got to, you know, win our first game. And then you could see those incremental growths. Um, there's a practice I do with a lot of my clients called the Ikigai and it's a Japanese way of finding your life's purpose and life meaning. And it's really learning, looking into like what you're good at, what you like to do, what you can get paid for, what the world needs. And like all of those are going to intersect in one thing. And like, for me, I love working with people and I love helping them, you know, become better versions of themselves. Right. Super generic. That could mean a million different things. Like one time it was strength and conditioning now it's, you know, mental and emotional health, but when it was strength and conditioning, like I loved those moments in between the sets or when we're walking from the field house into the weight room and guys are like, man, I'm like, how's your weekend? It's like, man, my, my girl, like we're struggling. And it's like, that is the stuff that is going to change someone's life. Like Mm. not necessarily, you know, getting them tenths of a second faster on a 40 yard dash. And so there's so many different modalities and ways to look at that that um now for me it's it's really just a curiosity of uh, working with people working with myself working with my friends kind of seeing what are the most efficient ways to create the biggest change Mm. you've obviously you know dabbled in a lot of these different modalities and been able to try different ways of training 
and diet, I'm sure, and, and combining all of these things in your own life as well to, before helping others. So what were some of the most effective mental health practices on your end uh, that you've seen pay dividends throughout your journey so far? Okay, so there's one that has changed my life the most, and I talk about it maybe on every podcast, but it's really important. Yeah. And um, it's, it's this idea that gets talked about a lot, which is taking ownership, but then how do we take ownership over our life? And one way I love to talk about it is through our language. And anyone that's anxious or stressed or nervous, if, if that's you listening, think about how many times you internally or externally say the word should. I should work out more. I should eat better. I should do ice baths. I should, whatever it is, right? And the shoulds are all there. It's a gray word. So it's, a, it's made up. It's based on other people's expectations of us. And if we're constantly living in that space, then we're going to feel all of these you know, negative and really like stressful emotions. And so when you take out the word should and insert, insert the words like want or don't want, you take immediate ownership over your language, which then helps you take ownership over your actions and then ultimately over your life. And then when you're in control, you feel better because you're able to, just like with athletics, you're able to really command your life in a different way. Yeah. These shoulds, a lot of the times they're uncomfortable, right? They're things that are new and that you haven't tried. And maybe that's part of the reason why a lot of people are holding back, but learning is so important to moving forward. And to me, I think growing up, you know, I had this struggle with like ego and is ego something that I should be giving fire to or pulling back from and, and where's the proper balance and, and, and how does it play with confidence? But as I've grown older, it seems that learning and ego go hand in hand, especially when you're learning something new that's uncomfortable. You start from scratch. You have to drop your ego because you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. So what has been your uh, take on ego as you have grown and helped a lot of different people? Is it something that we should you know, pay attention to? Is it something we should vanquish fully? What do you think on that? Yeah. I mean, it's so hard. Even the, even the shoulds in the question, right? Like what should we do this or that? And I'll be like, we well, could do whatever you want to do. And so do you want to give into your ego? Does it feel good when you do that? Does it feel good when you give into a higher power or service to other people and then start to kind of pull on that thread and see how that feels, you know, obviously we're social beings. And so we want to be accepted by the the collective, our, our family, our community, our friends. And so mm -hmm. at some level, we want to like, change who we are so that we're accepted by others. But if we do that too much, then we lose personal integrity with ourselves. And then we don't know who we are. And then wake up five, 10 years down the line and are like, what the am I doing right now? Like, I don't like this job. I don't like these people. I don't like this food. I don't like this shirt. Like, what am I doing? And then you have the midlife crisis. And so, uh, nope. you know, working to avoid that, it takes a lot of practice. It's really hard and, uh, you know, the country that we live in, where there's a ton of shoulds everywhere. I mean, you open up your phone, everyone's subconsciously telling you what to do um, to figure out what you like and what you want and then stand with that. And so one way I love to do to encourage people with that is to find allies in their life who support them the way that they want to be supported, mm. not the way that, you know, that person, you know, wants you to show up or wants you to be. Yeah, you've done that in your men's groups, right? And I want to touch on that a little bit. <clears throat> what is the biggest issue that you've seen in men today in this society, in this culture? And, and what is some of the solutions that you have given to help fix those problems? Yeah, I, it's there's so many different avenues, <laughs> but I, yeah. I like to break them down as simple as possible. And I'll just keep coming back to this, the, yeah. the shooting and the lack of ownership. Um, and when you do that, you feel out of control. And then we try to gain control through vices, you mm -hmm. know, drugs, alcohol, porn, whatever, the food, whatever it is, being super successful on paper, making a lot of money. But at the end of the day, we all want to be seen and loved and accepted for who we really are. But one question I ask a lot of the men is like, if you're in a relationship and your partner came up to you and said, hey, Mike, what's the absolute best way I can love you? Like, give me the playbook what would you say? And a lot of times they're like, uh, uh, I don't know. And it's like, well, 
if you don't know what you need and what you want to feel great, how the heck are you expecting someone else to do it? And so that is, again, that practice to try different things, you know, which is difficult because you are a beginner and so you're not going to feel maybe successful or good at it or enough, which can be another story for a lot of guys and people in general. But the more you stay with it and you can accept that and kind of work on the expectation, um, the happier you feel. Or maybe not happier, the more fulfilled. I, I, gotta, I try to be careful with that word, happy, because um, it's happiness really isn't a goal. Like honesty is a great goal. Mm, it's very true. Happiness is fleeting. Can be. Yeah, it's just an emotion. Like you want to be able to feel it, but it's impossible to feel happy all the time. Mm. Did when you were diving into yoga at a time where you were feeling broken down, did that kind of spark? Was there was there a spiritual aspect to it, or was it just kind of I need to get out of my body? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I wouldn't say I'm a religious person. Um, I would say I'm, I believe in spirit and more specifically nature and mm -hmm. um, energy that works in that in those ways. And so um, with yoga, I could feel different energy moving through my body. When I get into deep meditations, or I do like a palm meditation or qigong or some breath work, like I feel that resistance or not resistance, but I feel that, um, yeah, the energy inside of me. And I think we all feel that, right? Like when you meet someone, you might say, oh, I vibe well with that guy. Like he's super cool, right? Okay. You're reading his energy. You're <laughs> you're an energy worker you whatever you want to label yourself but we yeah. all can recognize that and it's a primal thing inside of us because uh, it's based on our nature we have to read people really quick to recognize if they're a threat or not um, in our society we don't have to do that because i'm not worried i'm going to walk down the street and someone's going to just attack me so i can kind of <laughs> put those defenses down right. but maybe when you're single or and you're out you kind of have a different energy about you because you're trying to read like does this girl like me does this guy like me and so uh, you can cultivate that awareness through slowing down through an introspective practice. And then ultimately what I believe is in nature, because nature is the most honest place that will be because a, a tree is just going to grow towards the sun. It's not going to lie and try to manipulate you. And an animal is going to go to the water when it's thirsty. It's not going to wait and be like, oh, I will have to pee. So I don't really want to <laughs> just going to go. And so if you put yourself in that honest place, a lot of your own personal you know, truths can arise as well. Mm. Yeah, nature, you and I are in alignment there. I mean, nature is so important to me, even when you start your day and, and, and escaping, you know, getting out and just being still being calm. I feel like it's so peaceful to unplug and, and be out in nature. What, um, what kind of sparked that with you? Was that always there? Or was it something that came on later in life? I mean, I think everyone feels good in nature to some degree. Yeah. Like no one goes to the beach, puts their toes in the sand, looks out <laughs> in the ocean. It's like, eh, like, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're all like, oh, it feels good. Like it's a natural thing. Um, yeah. But if we live, like I used to live in Manhattan. And so in there, there's no nature. And so it's this ton, this opposite of nature. It's tons of electromagnetic energy and just a lot of different energy that's not natural. And so you can't even see the sun. You can't see the stars. And so every time I would leave Manhattan and I would be in a place that was, you know, really raw and beautiful. I, I like to go to Costa Rica and, and surf. So I would go down there and my plan was, I would be like landing. I'd look out the window. I'd see like all of the trees and I'd start to cry because my, my eyes just take it in and are like, wow, this is what it means to really be a human being. Wow. Um, but, you know, a book I really love and, Something I, I did recently was a, a wilderness quest um, or a vision quest um, out in the land completely by myself and I worked with a guide who helped me um, with that practice. And it was uh, four days, three nights with no food, just water, um, wow. doing a lot of, you know, personal, personal growth and ceremony and ritual out in nature to connect more with myself, but through uh, the earth where, you know, we obviously all, all live. Wow. Okay. I'm really interested in this. now. <laughs> is, is fasting a part of, you know, your routine normally monthly yearly? Is it something that you do on a regular basis or no? Mm, I wouldn't say it's like a 
I'm super strict with it, but I'll use it to change my state. Like some people will use psilocybin or ayahuasca or whatever. Uh, I've explored some of those plant medicines, but I really love the fast because it's really hard. You know what I mean? It, it's hard, to, especially for me. I used to eat a rotisserie chicken every day. After <laughs> dinner. Like, I love food. Yeah. And so um, the reason that's important to fast in that specific setting is that you want to make yourself uncomfortable. Because when you're uncomfortable and you deplete your energy, you deplete your ego. So you can't, mm. those stories that you tell yourself, or, you know, if you're feeling, you know, down about something or depressed, you can't like, you know, climb a tree and have some fun that like kind of switches your mindset because you're yeah. tired because you don't have any food. So you have to sit in that and then, you know, ultimately work through it. Um, and so that was the main reason for, for that fast. What was the biggest realization that you came to when you were out there? Man, I will like, it's hard. So my belief is that like this, that personal story of like what I went through, the more that I tell that story, the cheaper that story becomes. Yeah. And so, um, protect it. I can tell you the like meat and potatoes of it, but I want to, cause I love sharing, sharing things, but you know, there are some things, especially in today's day and age where like, I don't know, it feels like a lot of stuff just shared and we like, uh, people like to share, you know, their whole life. Yeah. Um, there are some things that can be remain sacred. And for me, that's one of those things. Yeah, no, I completely understand that. I'm interested in, you know, these feats that you're doing, you know, the fasting, you know, the Turkish get-ups, and now your next feat is paddling 80 miles across the Atlantic Gulf stream in one night. And again, for a great cause for cystic fibrosis. Mm -hmm. So what lit the fire in you to decide to do yet another one of these and for a cause? Yeah. I mean, again, I'm, I'm really curious. So I love yeah. pushing my body. I also really love paddle boarding. Um, I used to compete like recreationally in stand up paddle board racing really? in New York and then a little bit in Costa Rica too. But um, that was a long time ago. And so my buddy actually reached out and asked me if I wanted to do this race, um, support this cause. And I was like, yeah, of course, sounds amazing. Like, I don't even have a paddleboard anymore. It's the winter time in Colorado, but let's do it. Let's figure it out. And so, um, yeah, we've raised as a team over uh, $22,000. Wow. And so uh, one of my buddies, his name is Alex and his niece has CF, cystic fibrosis. And um, yeah, he recruited some guys from the gym and then those guys recruited me. And so there's four of us total that are all paddling 80 miles um, together. Uh, we have our support boat that'll be with us, but we leave Bimini Bahamas um, in a little bit under two weeks for <laughs> at midnight paddle in the pitch black behind like a, a red light because we can't have a ton of light because it throws off the turtles like migrating towards the moon and then uh, yeah paddle out into the sunrise and then hopefully finish before the sunset depending on you know how everything goes is this a totally fasted thing as well or will you have fuel no i'll definitely be eating eating for this <laughs> yeah, one. yeah I, i've done a few of these like 15 to 18 hour like just constantly moving events and um they're like big buffets. Yeah. I mean, goodness, it can be <laughs> at that point. I mean, you're just constantly burning. Mm -hmm. There's a, a certain feeling I feel when I'm on the water. It's just, it's one of the best things ever. I don't know what it is. I love nature in general, but just the water, there's something about it. Any body of water, really. It could be a river. I don't know. Totally. Yeah. There, I think there's something in our vestibular system in the ears where like, you feel that movement and it's especially if it's self-propelled like a bicycle or running or paddling or kayaking where like you feel that move and with the water it like you feel it through the paddle and so you you coming forward that it does a lot for it, it there's a reason why you feel good yeah. there's been uh, some studies that have been shown to prove your feelings right there that's that's so cool out of all the places you know it seems that you've had a lot of travel and, and done a lot of, you know, activities, you know, you're surfing, paddleboarding, hiking, camping, et cetera. So what was some of, or one of, does one pop out above the rest? 
coolest experience or, you know, one experience that you were like, wow, this, this one is always, always with me. Was there one that stuck out above the rest when it comes to your travels? Yeah, I think like the physical one would probably be um, the rim to rim to rim, like ultra marathon in the Grand Canyon. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. I I mean, uh, it sounds, it sounds intense. (laughs) Yeah. Have you ever been to the Grand Canyon? I have. Do you know which rim you went to? I don't. It was a while ago. Yeah. Well, the the main rim is the South Rim. And so that's where there's like a lot of the hotels and most people go to the South Rim. And when you're standing at the top, you're looking at, it's like obviously grand. It's, you know, amazing. Um, And so we started there and you run seven miles or nine miles down to the river, Colorado River, and then seven miles along the river, seven miles up to the North Rim and then reverse it back. And uh, depending on whatever Strava or Garmin watch you have, it's between like 49, my watch said 52 miles and like 15,000 feet of elevation gain. Mm. But but like, and it's all self-supported. So you carry all of your food in a backpack, all of your water. You can, depending on the time of year, you can fill up water along the way. Um, But that was a really cool experience. I mean, descending down into the canyon, at 2 30 in the morning you know you're up top and it's 30 degrees and then you start running down you're so high because they're just like whoa my i'm in the grand canyon you feel the walls just like closing in as you descend down as you're just the moonlight and then before you know it you're at the bottom and then you know the middle of the day hits i wound up uh straining my knee pretty bad at mile 13 which hobbled me for a long way but it's uh yeah, it's a really, I highly recommend that for anyone. Like I'm not, I don't identify as an ultra, as a runner in general. Like I did a 5k and then I did that. And so I just, wow. it's really just about like keeping yourself fed and then moving and then just trying to keep a pace that's like faster than walking. But yeah, it's, I'm doing it again, uh, this fall, uh, with my partner, we're going to do it together. That's incredible. That's incredible. Does your partner like to do a lot of these athletic feats as well? She is super athletic and really strong. And something I call Colorado fit, like she's yeah. from Colorado and like is so humble with her athletic, like her athleticism and her strength. And she's like, Oh, do you think I could do this run? And I'm like, yeah, you're going to crush me. And she does. And then, she, but it's like, yeah. She just born like born differently. I don't know. It may be something in the altitude and then she works extremely hard. So uh, it'll be Amazing. really fun to see her, uh, you know, push herself through that. But I know she's going to do great. Better I than feel me. like, yeah, that's, that's awesome. I feel like there's a, a, that would have a great bonding effect on someone's relationship to push yourself hard like that together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you're going to go through all different phases with that, right? Like, mm-hmm it's going to get really uncomfortable at some point you're going to get super hot you're going to be tired hungry bloated cramping something's going to happen and then the way you can communicate through that uh, is huge i mean i used to do a lot of partner acrobatics where like i'm i'm like holding someone in a handstand in my hands and lifting them up or flipping them and catching them and you know men and women and through that there's a lot of communication that has to happen. Cause like I'm straining to hold you up and like you're straining to hold the handstand and like, we have to talk, but we can't have like, you know, attitude or anything like that. It's just right. be efficient and then come down, talk about what was good, what, what didn't go well, and then, you know, move on with it. So it's cool when you put yourself in an uncomfortable position with other people in general, but definitely more so with a romantic partner. Yeah, there's a there was an Instagram post that you wrote about the hows and whats in your relationship. Break mm-hmm. that down a little bit because I thought that was really valuable. Yeah, so it's like how you go about something is more important than what it is. So like mm-hmm. how we might deal with problems versus just like what the problems are is this yeah. is the simplest way of going about yeah. it. And so for me with with friendships, obviously with a with a with my partner. Um, I know we're going to have so many struggles. We're going to go through so many different phases of our life. I mean, one that we're going through now, we just move into a new home together and she has a a six-year-old son and I never lived, I never lived with a, with a child before. So it just brings up new 
new thing. I don't want to call them problems, just new opportunities for growth. And so the way that we go about dealing with that, how we do it is much more important than like what it is. Hmm. Yeah, that's powerful. You uh, mentioned the calisthenic side of what you do. And I feel like that's uh, a lot of, you know, your foundation is so strong on that in the calisthenics world. It's so hard for anyone, even just a traditional weightlifter that could lift, you know, 700 pounds or whatever. For, to be able to do a handstand, to be able to do calisthenics, like that is a different type of strength. And I've had guys on before who are really into calisthenics and they talk about this flow state that they get. And I'm so intrigued with this coming from the athletic background. Like you said, you know, getting in the in the zone before for the game, this flow state where everything just fades away. And it's, it's harder to find when you're out of uh, that, you know, arena. So. Mm -hmm. Do you find that flow state within calisthenics or is there a certain type of, you know, yoga or breath work that really puts you into that state? Yeah, I love that you brought it up. I, I first learned about flow as like a scientific practice, maybe 12 years ago. I read the book Flow um, yeah. and um, it's a positive psychology term. And so I, I study a little bit of positive psychology and essentially what that is, is like, if your life's pretty good, like, you know, 60 to 80%, like no major problems, but you're just feeling like it could be better. That's where positive psychology can come in to help close that gap. And, and that's a lot of the work I do with, with my clients. Um, it's helped them, you know, optimize and, you know, reach that peak performance. And one of the ways we do that is through adopting flow state. And the easiest way to describe flow is if you think of a chart, like a graph, and on one axis is the skill that you have, and the other is the challenge that you're trying to do. So I'll use you, for example. I don't know your exact physical you know, capabilities, but if I told you, okay, Mason, your, whole, your skill that I want you, the challenge I want you to do is 100 freestanding handstand pushups without your feet touching the ground. Oh, wow. that, that challenge is probably too high for your skill, which would yeah. be lower here. So you become anxious. But if I tell you your challenge is to do your workout today is one push-up. You just have to do one perfect push-up. That challenge is too low for all of the skill that you have, so you become bored. But if I tell you your challenge is to hold a one-minute handstand at the wall, come down for a minute, back up for a minute, come down, do that for five sets, that might be like just enough challenge where it requires all of your skill, and bam, then you're in flow. And so flow state is going to be different for everyone. And depending on what skills you have and what challenges you have. And so with calisthenics, it's great because you can never like complete calisthenics. You know, <laughs> you're never like, I'm the best at it. There's always something to, to work on. Right. And so there are always new challenges for your skills as they grow, as they grow stronger. And like with handstand in the beginning, it was like holding a crow pose, which for those that don't know, it's like your hands are on the ground then your knees are on the back of your triceps and your feet and your head are in the air and you're balancing on your hands. Once you can do that, then maybe you can go like front down to a headstand and then maybe you can come back up to a handstand and then maybe you could do a one-legged crow. And then, you know, it just goes on and on jumping into it. And there's like, <laughs> and then in order to do those different skills, those different challenges, you just need more strength or, and more body awareness. So then you can change it. You can train that in the gym by training those muscle groups that are then going to help you know, make those skills possible. And, you know, for me, it's kind of like a video game, more or less. I mean, I don't play video games, but yeah. it's like, if I want to unlock these new skills, I know I need more hamstring flexibility, more spinal articulation, more pushing strength. So I do a little three weeks, push, 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 stretch, 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 this, 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 boom, come back to the skill, bam, now I can do it. Or I get closer and I'm like, okay, I'm closer, feel motivated. Let me keep trying those things. Yeah. So you kind of tailor your approach towards that specific goal that you're working at. Yeah. I mean, I would suggest that for every goal, like <laughs> every goal you have tailor your approach for that goal. But with calisthenics, it's cool because it's like it directly feeds into that. Um, I think what happens too much with calisthenics and where people get frustrated is they view it as play, which mm. it is play, but it's also serious. Like when you play football, yeah, you're playing the sport, but if you just came to practice, like, all right, coach, like I'm here to play today. <laughs> Your coach would be like, this, like we got practice down to the minute. And so it's fun, but it's like controlled fun. And 
that's the same thing with a handstand. And so it's really advanced and, and there's a lot of uh, like small movements, small articulations, uh, different steps that are needed to take in order to be, be successful. And uh, it's something you fail at a ton. Like I've never failed at anything more <laughs> than handstand, but right. you know, I'm sure people on, on this podcast, I've talked about this before. It's like, it's not necessarily failing. You're just learning, gaining more information mm. and then able to come back. And the people that can pay attention to th what they're learning, obviously will then be able to make those adjustments and then be able to gain those skills faster. Absolutely. Big purpose of this show is to help people become aware of a lot of these things that we innately have aware of, you know, finding their vision and hearing from great people like you, Mike. But even when we get to this point, right, of, of being aware, there's times we can feel off and our alignment can be off, our compass can be off, right? And we feel that internally and physically. And, and like you said earlier, stress can manifest physically, it can cause us to break down in a lot of different ways. So whenever we do feel off or we do feel out of alignment, what are some of the tools or tricks that we can use in order to get back to that center? Yeah, great, great question. Um, first thing I'll say with that is it's okay to feel crappy. It's yeah. okay to have a terrible day. It's okay to not feel motivated. Um, those are all normal things. And so they obviously don't feel good. And I know a lot of the guys I work with are like, I just want to be like, killing it every freaking day. And I'm like, well, that's impossible. So, and it is like for every single person you ever talk to, like the rock, whoever you think is super successful, they're not every single day. And so I like to clear that off. And then the two that come to mind right off the bat are time and nature. So if you can like slow down to speed up, a lot of times mm. that sounds counterintuitive. Um, I think it was, uh, I forget, not Steve Jobs, um, man, who's a Microsoft guy? Bill Gates. Bill Gates. Gates, yeah, yeah. Gates. And then people have, the, uh, yeah, I have different opinions on Bill Gates at the moment, but like <laughs> right. one thing with him is uh, he would take like a think week where he would go away every year and just be by himself just to think and to let himself okay. like just be completely alone in a cabin and just think of what it is that he wants for his life. And that slow time, that dedication, that dedicated time, I imagine allowed him to innovate in whatever ways he wanted to innovate. And so um, I try and do that as much. And it seems counterintuitive, but if I'm feeling, I mean, literally did it last night, like <laughs> was feeling stressed out. There was a lot of stuff going on. My partner and I were like, you know what, let's get away to the mountains. Let's camp for this weekend. Obviously there's tons of stuff we could do at our house. Like we just moved in. And so there is a lot of things that we should yeah. be doing, um, <laughs> yeah. but those will always be there. And so the more we can feel stronger internally, um, mm -hmm. and we just like doing that through nature and through some practice that practices we have out there. Um, but the other one also gets a lot of airtime and rightly so. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been proven by the Institute right. of, via Institute of character, the number one trait for increasing your overall well-being, hands down is gratitude. Mm. If you can truly feel grateful, then it increases your ability to feel well. And uh, the second one, by the way, is love of learning. So kind of like what we've been talking a lot about that too. But, uh, you know, uh, people I'm sure have heard of a gratitude journal. And I'm not the biggest fan of just writing three things you're grateful for. It's like mm. my skin, my hair, the sun, <laughs> my breath, like those are all great, but um, they don't hit as hard for me as this exercise called the four W's, which is what went well and why. And what went well today and why. And the why aspect is so important because it helps mm. you recognize that you're empowered of the positive things that are happening in your life. And so what went well was this podcast with Mason. Why did it go well? Because I made sure I got good rest. I hydrated. I ate food. I was present. Like I was... I cared about it. That's why it went well. Not just like, I'm grateful that, that I like I'm on podcasts, you know, it, it really can help build up your self-esteem and self-confidence. Uh, yeah. When you can, again, take that ownership over the things that go positive in your life. That's, that's huge. The why is so important to everything. Simon Sinek did that. Uh, he has like the three circles and usually it's how, what, why, right. And that's how mm -hmm. a lot of people think of how I'm going to get there. What is it that I want and why, but really in reverse, 
is how we should be thinking. Why do I want these things innately? It's like working backwards, but it makes so much sense at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, I'll, I'll say this too. Like um, for me, the best, the best, like 4W is something so small. Like what went well today was the sun on my, was me being able to stand outside for one minute and feel the sun on my face and close my eyes and truly take in that moment. Yeah. Why did it go well? Because I was allowing myself to do that. First is like, I'm grateful for the sun. And it's, it's the yeah. small things that then really add up because, you know, our life is made up of all these small moments. You know, I'll tell a quick story. I was chatting yeah. with a friend the other day. Um, like I said, I live with a six-year-old now, which I love, super yep. fun, little guy. Um, you know, we play a lot. Him and I, as we're, you know, growing our relationship, we play a ton. That's, he's very physical, extremely athletic. And so uh, it's fun for us to engage that way. Yeah. And I was talking to my buddy who also has a six-year-old and he was talking about a, a, a career change, something he wants to do with his life. He's like, do I want to work for this bigger company and have more security, but not be around as my kids are growing up? Mm. He has some younger kids as well. Or do I want to you know, stay in this business that I'm running for myself, but you know, it's, and I spend a lot more time with my kids, but I also have stress because I have to be in control and have as much security at least theoretically. And so he was saying the reason that he wants to work for himself is because those moments with his kids aren't like at a birthday party or when they go to Disney World or when it's like big moment. Like the real moments that he loves and that I recognize that I love are those in-between moments with, with your kids and, and really with people and with yourself as well. It's those moments when you're just like walking to the park. Not when like after a baseball game, you just hit a grand slam and you're like, yeah. And like, you think he's going to come in to you. It's like those really in between moments. You just have to be there. You just have to be present for the safety of that relationship to grow. And so um, it's the same thing with the relationship with ourselves. We have to give ourselves that time um, for those inner, you know, realizations or feelings or emotions to, to come up. And then of course, have the courage to work through them. Uh, either with ourselves, with a coach, with our friends, you know, with a therapist, whatever you are looking for. Yeah, that's, that's so important to have that foundation of, you know, great people around you. I, I have one tattoo and it's iron sharpens iron, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's such a huge thing for me and, and a big backbone for the show too, because these types of relationships, right? You and I, we just met. And we're having a deep conversation that will be shared with a lot of people. How many of your friends that you've had for a long time, have you maybe not opened up and been vulnerable or family members or, you know, people that have hurt you in the past, those real raw, authentic conversations are, are really what can progress us in life. And, and I think are so important, but aren't had enough these days. You know, those little moments are so important they're everything but they take like an immense amount of courage because yeah. it's scary to do that like you know i i one time i had to ask my dad for a hug i'm like dad why don't, don't you hug me anymore and he's like oh my god i never knew that you wanted a hug i just thought you were like too cool you don't want these hugs anymore i was you know, 20 at the time i'm yeah. like no like i want to i want to like hug you want to have this relationship yeah. but for me to say that i was so nervous that he might be like what are you a little blah 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 yeah. and i mean my dad's not like that he's amazing but right. You know, even with my friends or with, you know, my partner saying, hey, you know, I'd really like X, Y, and Z. You know, that takes a, a it's really scary because they might write their own story about it. You might feel like they might not be honest back with you. Um, a book that I really like, and uh, it's pretty radical, hence the name of it. It's called Radical Honesty. And essentially the premise of it is like, we all wear these masks or facades of out into the world, like essentially the shoulds. So we want other people to like us, but then they like us for our mask. And then we never feel seen. And we, we write a story of like, no one gets me. Like, I'm just alone out here. Like, I don't have any true friends. Like, and how many people feel like that? Right. And then we just, you know, anyway, go, go down a rabbit hole of ways that we want to be seen. But when you actually can remove that mask by sharing what it is that you're scared to reveal to the other person in a safe container where they can do the same thing for you and you, there's like some agreements that are made before you do that. Um, you never feel closer. You never feel more close than you do to those types of people where you can be as open, honest, authentic, 
at whatever word you want to use, uh, that is another life-changing practice. But again, the first part is being honest with yourself. Because if you don't know, then you're just going to be regurgitating things that you think you should be saying. Right. For someone listening, they're like, yeah, Mike, it's easy for you to say, you know, you're in touch with your emotions, you're strong and athletic and gifted in these areas and a good teacher. And, you know, what do you have to say to them? And almost to the point of like, who was Mike before the man that we're seeing now? Was there some catalyst that happened or was this a gradual transformation? And for someone that's saying, how do I even start and get to this place of, you know, transforming my life, my body, my mind, spirit, where, where's this good place for them to say, let's start here? Yeah, I mean, the gratitude practice is a great place to start. You know, to answer your first question, for me, I was the biggest worrier and the biggest shitter on the planet. Like, I wanted everyone to like me so much. I would like Google things like what to wear on a first date. What to say, da, 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 da. like trying to just learn, like look outside as much as possible so that other people would like me. And once I recognize that, like that is only can go to a certain level. And I truly want to really be seen and loved for who I truly am, which again, only happened because I took the time to build those introspective practices. Right. Um, then the life changed. Then my life really started to change. And so for someone that is saying those things that you just mentioned, um, the gratitude practice, right? Three things, what went well today and why every day for a month, you're going to start feeling a lot better because you're going to start paying attention to the positive things that are going on in your life while simultaneously taking ownership over them. Mm. It's so powerful. Mike, where can everybody find you on socials if they're interested in one-on-one -on -one, men's group, et cetera, where can everybody find you? Yeah. Uh, one more thing for what you were saying too, because I, yeah. I mean, I just can't help myself. I'm a coach at heart. Do it's it. Like, do it. I my hope is that everyone listening to this podcast and never utters the word "should" again in their entire life. They go on a should fast. You can start with a week and see how it feels. Um, one thing I'll say with that is it's hard to know what you want. A lot of times it's like I 50 percent, 51 percent want this, and 49 percent want this, and that's like a hard distinction. Um, and so you just go with your first thoughts, your best thought, and you kind of lean in that way. But uh, if anyone listening to this podcast, I'd be happy to send them a little write-up I have on, on shooting. Um, again, they'll lean into <laughs> the way you can get that is by either DMing me on Instagram, mike.idella. Uh, you can email me, michael.idella at gmail.com. And then you can find out all information about my one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, my men's group uh, at mikeidella.com. That's my website. I'm going to have blogs and more information on there and a lot of the topics that we've talked about here. Yeah, you've done a great job building that uh, community and business. So bravo to you. You know, you, you're doing great things. There's a question that I love to ask, and I'm really interested to hear your perspective here. But what is your definition of success? Mm, the way that I can, the way that other people, the way I can really serve and support other people. Mm. Yeah, that's the easiest Plain and one. simple. I love it. I love. And there's it. so many ways, so many ways to do that too. Yeah. But if like, if every day I am working to, you know, in some way build a better world around me, uh, then I've done. I've, I've lived a good day. And a lot sometimes that's just building up myself because the better I am, the better I can show up for the world. That's that's a great perspective. It reminds me of I had a few gentlemen on the other day. Uh, the episode hasn't come out. So here's a sneak peek for anybody. But <laughs> They wrote a book called the five L's, right? And in one of those L's is love. And it's about a balanced life. And he asked me the question, he said, when you think of love, what do you think about right off the top of your head? And I said, family. He said, Yeah, you know, a lot of people say family, my relationship, my kids, my spouse. He was like, but what a lot of people don't say 90 plus percent is myself you know, and, and that is the most important because that relationship of love with yourself will trickle off into everybody else. So I love that you've touched on that today. It's so important to hear. Yeah. I mean, that's my wish for the world. I want you to do exactly what it is that you want to do. And, you know, uh, Mary Oliver has a great poem and in it, there's a line. Um, I forget the name of the poems. Uh, I'm losing it right now, but it's like, you just have to let the soft body that you have love what it loves. That's like your only job on this world, just to let yourself love what you love. Um, 
And so finding people that support you loving what you love, you allowing your you allowing other people to love what they love. Um, I think the world needs a lot more of that. So amazing. Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure and blew my expectations out of the water, right? I, I was excited for today and I'm, I'm super happy that we got to have this time together. I know it's going to affect a lot of people in a positive way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you as well. It's been super fun. I, uh, I really am you know, appreciative of you creating this space and, and also for helping so many people. You know, I know it's not easy running a podcast, having a lot of people on and sharing a positive message. So, uh, you know, personally, thank you for all the work that you're doing uh, for this world. It, it means a lot to me. Appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Go check Mike out at all of his socials. I will put them in the link below as well and go donate to the cause paddling 80 miles for cystic <laughs> fibrosis. Amazing. I know I'm going to, so much love to you, Mike. Thank you so much for the value you brought today and good luck. I'm excited to hear about how it goes and hopefully see you in Nashville here soon. <laughs> yeah. All right, brother. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you.